नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग एंड वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम वंस अगेन टू दी अनादर राउंड ऑफ देखो अपना देश वेबिनार I speak to you from Delhi but today we have exciting round of a second visit to the northeastern part of our country which is so beautiful so green it has so much to it and that we had to do a second one and i'm sure we'll be doing a third and a fourth and a fifth one because there are seven sisters in the northeast and we will keep bringing you something out of that region today we have uh, four speakers in fact to talk to us uh, about the northeastern part of region and why it makes all the right senses to go there for tourism julie julie kakti is going to be speaking from bengaluru david angamini is speaking from kohima devraj barua is speaking from jorhat and pimso gyatso is speaking from sikkim so viewers isn't technology so amazing that i am here in delhi you all are at various places we actually had people logging in from 60 plus different countries around the world apart from all my fellow citizens my brothers and sisters from india and my four speakers today are from different parts of india so i think that's the power of technology and we are glad to be able to bring to you the different aspects of our incredible india however this is as i always say a frozen platform it's a virtual platform we are using this in the period of covid when we are supposed to do social distancing not travel as much as we would normally love to so please use this only as a temporary stop gap arrangement and as soon as you are traveling back please do remember to go and visit the beautiful northeast i'm not going to take too much time except tell you that today we are not going to restrict once again to one city or one aspect of northeast but we shall be going to nagaland arunachal pradesh assam meghalaya manipur and to my all time favorite sikkim so julie all yours to take us through uh, this webinar of today thank you viewers for joining us namaskar i think up dekho apna desh is a wonderful platform and we are very thankful to be a part of it without much ado let me take you to the presentation in the earlier series of the webinar the northeast has been introduced so i'm going to quickly recap this image for you there are eight states that make up the northeast sikkim has been added uh, let me move this i think it's on the way yeah sikkim sikkim was added later on mainly because of similar geography and tribes that live in that region there are nine functioning airports the railway connectivity is limited the most destinations are accessible by road especially to the interior lovelier villages and the more pristine landscape the best time to visit is pre and post monsoon that's in the month of october to april that's also when the sanctuaries are open post the monsoon i'm often asked to describe the northeast what makes it so special you know what is so exotic why is not known who are these tribes there are lots of questions that people ask me uh, this happens to me at dinner parties it's happened to me while once waiting at the reception area in a dentist you know in random places people ask me these things so to recap it or to just tell you that it comes down to three broad things for me one is the tribes is the largest amount of indigenous communities in the country live here and the origins of these tribes are from mongolia central china burma thailand in that region tibet these tribes over centuries have mingled and formed their own identities you know their festivals are extremely vibrant and they've held on to a way of life that forefathers have followed so there is something there that's wonderful to see you know very colorful the second would be the diverse species of flora and fauna some of it which are extremely unique and not found in any other part of the world third is the beautiful landscape you can drive for hours you know without any human habitation the amount of water bodies it's famous for water bodies from waterfalls to rivers little streams lakes icy peak mountains of the himalayas all the way down to the tropical ferns and beyond to mustard fields uh, rice paddies the rice paddy fields by the river brahmaputra these make it special 
What is immersive travel? The term is used so often these days. What is it? Uh, you know, in the 1980s, it was travel journalism, uh, travel journalists who actually coined the phrase immersive travel, experiential travel, because that's when this whole thing of, was emerging. It basically means going a step beyond being a spectator tourist in a destination, when you actually immerse and engage uh, with activities in that destination to whatever your interests are. Yeah. The basic philosophy of it ties in with that of low impact tourism, which is less harm or no harm to the communities or the environment that you're going through. And uh, for immersive travel to really mean something, it needs the active participation of the tribes or the communities that live there. So the Northeast, because of the variety of uh, the geographic location, the varieties of, you know, the snow-capped peaks to the, uh, to the tropical uh, plains, the vegetation, the different tribes that live there. So there's a lot that is offered for everybody, from a solo traveler to, uh, to a family holiday, you know, lots of things. So uh, whether you're interested in sports, it could be polo, golf, trekking, camping, uh, just a picnic by a riverside. Cultural immersion, going to villages, you know, immersing in their culture to make paper, uh, incense, incense stick making, to learn about artifacts, you know, homestays, food tours, bicycle rides, um, walking tours, uh, textile. These are the big things there to do. Yeah. So in today's presentation, we'll be taking you to only a few destinations and activities there. So without much ado, let's move on to Nagaland and I hand over to David. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Julie. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is David, and today I am going to be speaking on Nagaland, um, but uh, specifically uh, on Kohima district in Nagaland. Now, Kohima district is uh, one of 11 districts that make up Nagaland. It is home to the Angami tribe, one of 17 uh, recognized tribes of Nagaland. And uh, it, it is home to the capital of Nagaland, Kohima City. Now, Kohima City is accessible by road from Imphal and Dimapu. And the nearest uh, airport and railway station are in Dimapu. And from Dimapu, it is a two hour drive to come up to Kohima. Now, uh, there are three destinations that I specifically want to talk about. And these are Zuku Valley, um, Kigwima Village, and the Southern Angami Village Cluster. And obviously, the Hornbill Festival. Now, uh, thank you, Judy. So the first um, destination is Zuku Valley. Uh, Zuku Valley is uh, 30 odd kilometers south of Kohima. Um, there are two trekking routes to this valley and, uh, and the time taken to uh, go, uh, trek this uh, to Zuku Valley is about uh, three and a half to five hours, depending on which route you take. Now, the first part of the hike is fairly difficult because the terrain is extremely steep. But once you reach the top of the hill and then you walk into the valley, it's a very nice, gentle uh, walk into the valley. And you, it takes about uh, an hour or so of walking, flat walking to the base camp of the valley. Now, once you reach the base camp, the entire valley opens out to you. And, uh, and the scene that, that presents itself to you is something quite um, and magnificent and quite spectacular. You know, you have acres and acres of, uh, of lush green vegetation as far as the eye can see. And uh, you have uh, very small rivulets and sparkling water that crisscross across the valley and an occasional cloud that will roll in and roll out. So uh, the scene is, is quite uh, breathtaking. And for a first timer, it, it really leaves a very deep impression um, uh, on you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the valley is, um, is uh, borders Assam and, uh, and Nagaland and uh, it is uh, well uh, considered to be the most popular destination in, in Nagaland and it is quite uh, uh, an adventure to go up to this, uh, to this uh, valley. Uh, Julie, can we have the next slide please? Right, so the best seasons to go up to the valley are you know, obviously pre-monsoons, just before the rains come in. 
And uh, during this time, the entire valley is in bloom. Um, you, you can see the very famous Zuku uh, lily there on the right, uh, on the right of your screen. Um, the entire valley is carpeted with wildflowers, and it is a fantastic uh, photo opportunity for uh, amateurs and for professional photographers. And a lot of people visit the valley during this time. Now, post monsoon is also a good time to go up to the valley. Uh, October, November is a fantastic time, as um, uh, just after the rains when it is extremely clear, and uh, you get stunning sunrises and sunsets in the valley. And if the night sky is clear, you get spectacular. Uh, you can do some fantastic stargazing, spectacular night sky, as you can see uh, in the middle picture. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, the traffic to Zuku Valley has been increasing uh, quite rapidly over the last few years. So the stakeholders have uh, come together and they've put in a little bit of um, uh, checks and balances to protect the valley. Uh, chief among them is a a ban on single-use plastic. Uh, and secondly, now trekking to the valley requires a guide to be with you, a local guide. Uh, this guide will not only guide you, but will also uh, ensure that certain leave no trace policies are followed. And thirdly, you know, camping in the valley has been stopped. Uh, one can camp in the surrounding hills and the base camp, but one can't actually go down to the valley to camp. And this has been done. Uh, to protect the valley and to keep the valley in a pristine condition for the future generations. Um, Julie, can we have the next slide, please? Right, so the next destination is um, Kigwima village. Uh, this village is also uh, in Kohima district. It is about 15 kilometers away from, uh, to the south of Kohima. And I use the, the example of Kigwima village for my village heritage walk. But um, really, uh, in Nagaland, there are many, many villages that have these heritage village walks. And these are an extremely popular activity um, uh, in Nagaland. And what does this uh, village heritage walk uh, mean and, and what is it all about? Well, it's, it's simply um, a guided walk through the village. Okay, and, um, and along the way, uh, the guide will uh, tell the visitors uh, about the history of the village, you know, the, the social structure of the village, um, you know, the little quirks of the village, and um, you get to experience what a Naga village is all about, right? And um, the, the visitors that go through this uh, activity um, get to participate in traditional games, get to participate in traditional activities, you know, a little bit of handicraft making, weaving, you know, traditional song and dances. And at the end of the walk, um, there's a small meal prepared for the visitors and they can come and they can, uh, you know, sample traditional Naga food. Um, I know traditional Naga food is extremely spicy and quite um, an acquired taste. Uh, so we always prepare a dal sabji and a, and a rice just in case people are not very adventurous. But uh, that is what the, the village experience is all about. Now, uh, in Nagaland, it is extremely important to us. Uh, Julie, uh, way back a little bit. In Nagaland, it is extremely important to us uh, to promote our village uh, uh, activities because uh, the Naga community is built on its villages and its clans, right? And so we feel that it is extremely important to uh, showcase our unique uh, Naga heritage to people who visit us. And secondly, there is a little bit of a monetary benefit to the villagers uh, who uh, take part in these activities. And for them also, it is a way to earn some supplemental income through uh, tourism. And, and speaking about culture, Julie, can we have the next slide, please? Right, speaking of culture, now, uh, Nagaland is known as the land of festivals. Uh, we Nagas are extremely fond of our festivals. We have 17 major tribes, uh, many, many sub-tribes, and every tribe has more than two uh, festivals in a year. Yeah? So if you, you, you or cumulatively, we have more than 35 uh, festivals in a year. So what has happened is the government uh, organized a, a cultural festival called the Hornbill Festival. And through this festival, it enabled all the tribes to come together 
in one location and to showcase our culture and our, our rich heritage and our vibrant festivals to people who are coming in to participate. Now, this festival was started in 2000 and over the years it has become an extremely big festival. It is perhaps the biggest festival in the Northeast uh, with regard to culture and it is held every year from the 1st of December to the 10th of December uh, in Kisama Heritage Village and every year it brings in lakhs of visitors during that span of 10 days. So with so many people coming in for the festival there was a logistic problem with uh, accommodation yeah and so a lot of these small campsites came up around the vicinity of uh, of the festival venue and they provide not only cheap alternate accommodations for uh, budget travelers but also have a lot of activities um, like cycling and you know hiking and trekking uh, for these uh, for our guests over there and, and over the years we have found that the demand for trekking and hiking have only increased so many of these campsites like Camp David and Camp Yetika uh, have decided to keep themselves open the entire year and they organize cultural uh, and uh, adventure activities um, uh, every month uh, where people, especially locals, can come and participate. The goal ultimately uh, for these campsites are to enable as many people as possible to uh, take part in adventure activities safely uh, and in the right manner so that we are able to sustain uh, the environment, we are able to sustain to protect the environment and we are also able to uh, have, uh, provide these guests a, a very safe environment for them to do these adventure activities. Um, and I think that is it for my presentation. It was a very short presentation, uh, but I do hope that in future uh, you visit the Northeast and you give us the opportunity to host you. And now I hand uh, over the mic to Mr. Dave Raj Barua, who will be speaking on Arunachal Pradesh. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Raj, and I'm going to be talking to you about Arunachal Pradesh, which is the largest state in the Northeast. With more than 70% of the total land area under forest cover, this state is one of the most unexplored states in the entire country. When it comes to diversity, Arunachal is really blessed by this. I mean, an array of landscapes, all sorts of flora and fauna, and even cultural diversity for that matter. That's the people. This one state has 26 major tribes and over 100 sub-tribes, which means every few kilometers that you travel, you'll be chancing across different kinds of food, different attires, different colors, weapons, practices, rituals, and even dialects for that matter. So to come across a new dialect every few kilometers that you go, it's quite bizarre. So, but now in this brief time, I can only talk to you about so much. So I'm going to talk about a certain tribe called the Monpa tribe, who are located mainly in the West Coming district of the state. Now, before I get to the tribe, let me give you a short background on the district. So the West Coming and the Tawang district make up one of the most popular tourism circuits in the whole of the Northeast. Often, when you're discussing this region with your friends, your family, you will probably chance across this Buddhist trail to Tawang with stories of war and high altitude lakes and snowy peaks. Tawang is already quite a famous destination. However, today we're going to be talking about a slightly lesser known destination, which is on the way to Tawang. Uh, there's a place called Dirang and half an hour off that is this small village called Sangti in Sangti Valley. We've got no hotels there. We've got no guest houses there. It's just mainly a few homestays right now and a little bit of camping that happens. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the village. Julie, if you could. So yeah, there it is. That's Santi Valley. It's pretty much, as you can see, it's like a painting from school with the mountains and the meandering river that flows through it. It's, 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 it's quite a stunning destination. A natural destination, it's a good uh, option for people who want to get away from the hustle bustle and the concrete that Dirang has. You have to pass Dirang anyway when you go to Tawang. You will be stopping over. So you might as well stay in a more natural destination if your interests are such. So now Mon uh, Santi is basically a Monpa village. There are two more tribes in this region. That's the Akka and the Sherdukpen. But the Monpa in this region, they are the major tribe. So we'll talk a little about them. The Monpa have, like many other tribes, they have an extremely rich cultural heritage. Theirs has been influenced 
over centuries by so on the eastern flank we've got the himalayan kingdom of bhutan up north we've got tawang and then subsequently tibet so that's where these cultures have come in over many many years and they've shaped uh, who the monpa are today that being understood now if you go to the next slide here so here you'll see these are the this is a picture taken during losar of the monpa performing in uh, what is the most popular form of dance drama in the in the region it's a depiction of the ramayana with its origin in tibet it's called the aji lamu dance now this beautiful dance is done by five performers and these five performers it uh, it's a high energy performance and it goes on what's really amazing about it is it goes on for over almost 12 hours they start early morning and in the evening and they take just one break for lunch so it's 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 quite amazing to see how these people that have been practicing this entire story and very coordinated it's, it's a beautiful performance so this picture was taken in february that's when losar happens losar is the most important festival for the monpa it is the lunar new year that's the calendar that they follow it's we right now we're in the year 2147 which is the year of the rat so anyway so this dance is just one of the elements of the many different things of their cultural heritage right but now to provide for immersive responsible tourism in the village uh, if you go to the next slide julie please so here you'll see how we've identified few elements of their cultural heritage and uh, we've curated experiences around them so as to educate not only the travelers who come to make their experience better but it what these do is they also add to preserving these local traditions and the traditional knowledge among the young guides who uh, are now getting an incentive to hold on to their culture so i'll just go over these elements with you so the first one is a very interesting element it's called uh, shuk shuk the paper making that you see here it's basically made the same way that the egyptians would make it from the papyrus plant they go to the forest they peel off the bark of this plant it's called the shuk shuk in the local language pulp it uh, boil it and then they make with a screen they make these this it's it's a slightly thinner it's beautiful looking paper the paper has been mainly used for very long in monasteries for scriptures for religious writings but now with the demand going down it's very sad to see how most of the people have now given up this art and there are under 10 people that we have identified in the entire region not just in sangti but in the entire region that are still practicing this art so now we've turned it into a workshop so not only are the locals taking interest when they seeing us from outside coming and uh, making the paper but then now uh, they have more incentive to hold on to something that makes up their identity right so that's paper making then we move on to foraging and local cuisine so you see the monpa like a lot of other tribes in this entire region in northeast they've grown up interacting with uh, with nature right so when you're going on a walk with them it's very interesting to go beyond the beautiful rivers go beyond the mountains and actually understand their in depth knowledge of plants and how they interact with nature so you we what we do with our guests is we go for a walk collect some plants which are edible medicinal come back home and then we cook we have cooking workshops and we cook uh, some traditional recipes so here you'll see a video where we're making some traditional local noodles with a chirshing it's a machine i mean it's a mechanism wooden mechanism that they used to use traditionally and momos you just go through the video this happened in february again i'm not sure if the video is playing right now but i'll still uh, talk a little about the cooking so chirshing is you use this wooden thing you put the dough it's got holes in it and uh, it goes through so is the presentation playing so anyway it goes through and then you slightly thicker noodles and it's 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 quite an immersive experience because not only are you learning about local recipes and local culture but you also have interactions and stories So he's currently making. You can make more than one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so
So yeah, that's pretty much cooking and uh, this happened in February again during Loser. So moving past cooking now, uh, I'm going to hold on to Buddhist flag printing and bamboo weaving. Let's talk about incense stick making. So the Monpa, they're a Buddhist, uh, they ha they're Buddhist by faith. And there are a lot of monasteries. Every village has a monastery. Every household has a prayer room. So in their daily life, they use a lot of uh, incense, which is slightly, it's quite different from the incense that we normally see in the markets. It's a, it's a coreless with, with a bamboo core. That core is not there. And this again goes back. So there's only one center in the entire region. There's only one center uh, called the Chilipam Monastery. It's again a monastery. And we go there to actually learn to learn a little more. Again, it goes back to in-depth understanding of plants, right? So we learn more about how these monks go around the year, different altitudes, different seasons, and they're collecting over a hundred plants. They're collecting over a hundred plants and they're buying, putting them together, making a pot, and then making these incense sticks. So you can actually make it with them and you get to understand how uh, the locals have interacted with nature for so long and depended on nature for so long. That being said, then there are, of course, we've got treks, village walks, and uh, uh, treks, village walks, and cycling. So when it comes to these three, it's basically in this base. Now, you might be interested more in architecture. You might be interested more in food. So based on your interests, we'll take you around. So uh, the village walks and cycling is around the village, of course. And then hiking, there's something for everybody. You could want to go on a hike, uh, which is a day tour. There are much longer intense seven day treks like the Bailey historic Bailey trail, the Nagajiji trail. You can go up to the mouth of uh, quite a few, the sources of the rivers. And it, it's, again, it's a great experience that can be there for the adventurous. Then we'll move here. If you see to this on this, on the screen right now, I'm going back to bamboo weaving and traditional uh, flag printing. So bamboo weaving, again, having depended on nature for so long, the Monpa have been making a lot of, they have very intricate weaves when it comes to making their daily products, like their baskets, their lunch box when they're going to, to the field for agriculture. They're carrying these uh, baskets with them and they've been depending. So you actually get a chance. You sit, you have some rice beer, enjoy your alcohol. It's quite strong, by the way, the Monpa alcohol, I must warn you. Uh, so you're making these baskets and you can take it back for your family. It's quite an interesting experience. They now, again, another on. interesting... Hello? I'll just talk about... I, I can't... It seems to be stuck on my screen, but I'm just going to continue talking. Uh, hello? Julie, can we go back to the... Dave, can we move on? Uh, to the... Okay, to the next to special interest tours. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Julie? I'll quickly just conclude. So anyway, these are just some elements. I'm sure we'll discover more along the way. And I hope post everything gets, uh, post everything gets, uh, I mean, once everything gets fine, we'll hope to see you this side and explore more of these. Anyway, with that, I'll conclude with how to get there and times to visit. So between October and March is the best times. Winters are too cold. I mean, peak winters, December gets too cold. So come prepared accordingly. These are high altitudes. Uh, you could be going from 5,000 feet to 14,000 feet in a couple of hours. You have to drive here from Guwahati. It's almost nine hours. It's a long journey, but trust me, it's worth it. And uh, that's about it. So with that, Tashi Delek and thank you.
Hello, am I on? I hope so. Uh, what was special be? You talk about special if you talk about no relation required, like which is involved. So this is good. How long would you need? So that we covered uh, make two itineraries. One covers the West region, Sam and Meghalaya. The other uh, Manipur. The Western regions of Meghalaya are focused on a larger duration, uh, food centric. You will start at the airport, which is in Guwahati, and carry on to Manas. Manas has the national park there. And uh, you, know, you can, you know, apart from a food centric holiday, you can also do uh, wildlife because the Manas National Park borders the kingdom of. Maybe this is Julie, are we showing a video? Hello. Julie, are we showing a video or are we, the screen seems to have frozen. Yeah, there we are. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry, I think I, I've got, I lost connection for a bit there. Well, I'm in the IT capital of Bangalore and that happens. Anyway, uh, we've talked about destinations and activities. Let me run you through what a special interest tour would look like. Suppose your interest was food and you came there. How long would you need? What is the duration? What, what activities could you cover? You would probably on a nine night, 10 day, cover about four destinations. Activities apart from it being food centric, you could uh, you know, do a bit of wildlife, rafting. Uh, Manas is a destination I've chosen, which is close to Guwahati. Guwahati has the airport, it's three and a half hours away. It borders Bhutan. The tribe that live here are the Boro tribe. They're the initial, original inhabitants of the region. Then uh, Bonia Bongaiga are uh, these, the Sotabari. Sotabari has the largest uh, cottage industry in, India, in Assam, which is not textile but it is bell metal utensils. They make bell metal utensils. They're quite lovely to see these workshops, all set up in the courtyards or backyards of people's homes, uh, surrounded by arachna trees and bamboo. So you can buy directly from them, do a workshop with them. The next destination would be Tura, which is the home of the Garo tribe in Meghalaya. This region is hilly and is known for its cash crop farms. It's quite lovely to visit the cash crop farms and plug directly, see how they cultivate. And you know, they live very in harmony with nature. The beautiful waterfalls there to go for picnics and little treks. And along the way, when you're going up the hill, the farmers sell their produce of the day in, uh, in, in the roadside. It could be different kinds of pumpkin, the lots of lemon, cashew, pepper. Now they've introduced coffee too. So lots of products are there. So you buy from there and you visit these villages homes, the village homes located in the interiors. Where, and the interesting thing about these homes where you go, your host and you cook together, it could be in the courtyard or in the inside their home, is that this region doesn't use oil or spices. They use leaves and herbs to flavor their food, you know, to make it more sour, more pungent. It's very interesting, especially in today's day where, where we're concerned about health and you know, uh, how we cook. On the way back to Guwahati, there are two stops. One is by the Kulsi River to see the river dolphin and do a cooking class there of Assamese food. The other is this very uh, little known fact that people really don't know is Darangiri, which is the largest wholesale uh, mandi market for bananas in the whole of Asia. It's located there. On a shorter duration, Manipur I've chosen for textile. You land in Imphal. Imphal is, you know, has a lot of uh, monument, uh, sorry, museums. It has a lot of art galleries, 
a lot of designer restaurants and also NGO projects, one of which hires a hundred backstrap loom weavers, which is located nearby. To visit them, it's quite lovely to interact with them. You can even have a meal there. I think Manipur, because of its long, uh, you know, royal patronage, their art, you know, the art and culture, their performances, their textile, their ritual practices are very fine. The lot, the high level of finesse, and um, that's why I chose Manipur as a destination for textile. Though then there are a lot of tribes and the Maithi community. The Maithi community is best seen. The work of theirs is best seen in Bishnupur. Bishnupur is also the location where the first uh, Hindu temple was set up in uh, Manipur. It's a Govinda temple, a small terracotta structure. There they weave these, I'm wearing one, these beautiful gauze, fine, you can see how fine this is, silk uh, dupattas that they call Rani Fee. And this pattern on the edge is called a Moirang Fee, which has these very intricate weaves in it. I hope you can see that. So it's really nice to see that. The extracurricular activity here could be a visit to Kaibu Lamjam National Park. It's the world's only floating sanctuary. And the deer is found exclusively here. You can do a canoe ride with the uh, forest officials here. Another interesting place nearby is Moirang. Moirang is the first, you know, the first time the Indian tricolor flag was hoisted was here on Indian soil. It was hoisted elsewhere first, but on Indian soil, this is the first place it was hoisted. The next destination would be Churachanpur. It's home to the Zao or the cookie community. The women there, I call them memory keepers because they weave this intricate pattern in these backstrap looms. They have nothing written, there's no drawing. It's how do, the, how, does the, how do these traditional patterns get passed on? It's when the mothers and daughters weave together. To be there, it's, heart, you know, it's heartwarming. To be there in that moment, to see them do this. You know, the daughter's imitating the mother and she's copying the pattern. And that's how she picks it up. It's really beautiful. You know, Asia is defined by her market. So on the way back, when you reach Imphal, you might want to visit Yumaketan. It's a 300-year-old market where you get exotic fruits, flowers, um, handmade knives, uh, baskets of all sorts, all handmade, natural fiber, and an array of textiles. It's run by a married woman, exclusively run by married women. That whole market, there's no, I mean, all the, all the vendors there are women. Yeah. So that would be a special interest tour. Uh, among a food tour, the most interesting thing about a food tour is doing workshops, cooking workshops or demonstrations in villages throughout the Northeast. Uh, I was talking about River Kulsi. You can see the image on the right hand side. That's the setting. It's so pretty. By the way, it's such a lovely setting. In the center, you'll see men using these bamboo sleeves. The Northeast, we use a lot of bamboo sleeves to grill meat and vegetables to give it a smoky flavor. I've actually included that image on the top left-hand corner of my, you know, I'm holding fiddle headphone to bust this myth that the Northeast doesn't have vegetables. We have a lot of vegetables uh, and a lot of greens. Fiddle headphone and mustard uh, greens are common throughout the Northeast and cooked in different forms. But to me, the most treasured moment of this experience is after the cooking is done, when the entire village or part of the village, everybody gets together with you and we are eating. That's when all the stories come alive, the myths, the gossips. And for that moment, you know, for that hour or so, you are part of the same canvas. Isn't that lovely? I really think it is. Textile is a passion for me. I learned to weave at the age of eight in Assam with my grandmother. Uh, reluctantly at the age of eight, but thank God my grandmother was, you know, she was a tyrant in those days and she forced it. Let me take you to a video. Uh, to a video. Before that, I would like to say that weaving in the Northeast is woman-centric. And most weavers, every village if you go, there'll be, weave, you know, every home will have a loom. Uh, unfortunately, in the urban areas, it's, uh, you know, disappearing. But it's mainly for personal use and not for commercial use. Let's do a video there. To really understand a product or an artisan's sensibility, aesthetics, you need to spend time in that environment, you know, in that society, to really feel it, to see it. Hands-on demonstrations show you the love for the craft, you know, the, the amount of labor that goes in. You know, it explains to you why a particular thing was created. It's uh, the region, you know, is a lot 
dictates it. This part of the tours are normally very popular, especially among our women guests, where after a demonstration of how it's woven or created or set together, you wear the costume, you put on the headgear, you wear the jewelry. You, then it's a holistic experience. You understand why it was created, what it like. You know. So with that, uh, let's move on to the next destination. I think we've lost a bit of time there. Sikkim, and I hand over to Pincho. Thank you, Julie. Uh, very good morning to all. And uh, let me first start off by saying that it's, it's a very nice cool 14 degrees where I am. I'm actually feeling cold. So I hope I can get a couple of people envious about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about Sikkim uh, as a destination and um, uh, you know, try and uh, bring together the entire concept of ecotourism. That is something that um, I've been given the distinct pleasure of trying to do that. Um, really quickly, uh, Sikkim is one of the smallest states in India, right? Uh, we're barely 7,096 square kilometers in, in landmass. And uh, we border uh, Nepal on one flank, uh, Bhutan on the other, and Tibet on the other. So we've surrounded every, but on all sides. Okay, and of course, the huge eastern Himalayan range. Um, and of course, barring Assam, I think it's probably one of the heaviest uh, tourist footfall regions in the, you know, in the Northeast. Okay. And in terms of people, I mean, of course, my colleagues have spoken a lot about, uh, you know, uh, the communities and the tribes. Very basically put, uh, Sikkim has three distinct communities, the, the Bhutias, the Lepchas, and the Nepali. And um, I'm not going to get too much into detail of that because I'd like to cover some other, some other topics uh, as we talk about Sikkim today, right? Um, so today, like I mentioned, we're going to focus a little bit more on, on, on sustainable travel and on ecotourism. And I, will, I would like to focus a bit more uh, on the things to do in Sikkim on those lines. Yeah. Um, what are we famous for? What do, we, what, what do people come to Sikkim for mostly? And, and I would say that's usually uh, the first thing would be landscapes, the, the beautiful, dramatic, and uh, varied topography that Sikkim has. And of course, our monuments, a lot of old monasteries in Sikkim, right? And uh, the two major sects of Tibetan Buddhism in Sikkim are the, the Kagyu and the, and the Nyingma, of course. Um, Julie, if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, yes, very striking pictures again here. Um, let me start off by saying that on the big picture on the left-hand side, that's Yumthang Valley. Uh, that's Wild Primula and Yak, and it's a picture postcard, right? Uh, this is in the north district of Sikkim. Uh, very, very beautiful, very popular also from visitors. Uh, on the right-hand side, on the top side, we see those are the winding, uh, the, the winding loops of Zuluk. This is in eastern Sikkim, and uh, very popular, again, uh, for for visitors. This is actually the old Silk Route, uh, you know, the Indo-Tibet uh, trading that used to happen. And it's believed that the name Zuluk actually means, uh, you know, load your musket. So that the, 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 the invading, let's say, the, 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 the British forces that were coming up from the, the lower hills were met with some resistance by the, the Tibetan forces in the top of the hill. So that's how apparently the, the area got its name, Zuluk. You know, very beautiful and located around 13,000 feet, you know, and that's one of the highest places that I know of in, in, you know, where you can actually spend the night, you can actually stay here. So uh, very picturesque, very beautiful. And uh, of course, uh, popular destinations in Sikkim also means that, you know, we've veered a lot into mass tourism. And interestingly, now, uh, you know, the region is getting a lot more into trying to spread out, let's say, travel uh, into lesser known destinations across Sikkim, because every nook and corner has so much to, to show and so much to do, right? So uh, let me just break it up also really quickly into four districts. We have the west of Sikkim, which is known for the magnificent views of the mountains. Uh, Kanchenjunga, the third highest peak in the, uh, in the world, is, is viewable from almost every corner in West Sikkim, right? Um, the south are known mostly for organic farms, uh, which Sikkim is known uh, widely for now, organic uh, produce. Um, the east, which is where Gangtok, the capital city where I'm speaking from right now, is located. And, and of course, North Sikkim, uh, is, is one of the more dramatic and the very, very beautiful uh, region of, of Sikkim and also located at a much higher altitude in general. Okay. And um, I won't get into too much details, like I mentioned, uh, in terms of destinations and experiences like my colleagues did. Okay. But I, I would like to cover more on a broader scope of ecotourism experiences in Sikkim. Okay. So um, if you can get onto the next slide, Julie, please. Um, I'm going to talk about a really quick uh, description on the pillars of ecotourism. 
Well, uh, very simply put, I would like to say that this is engagement in the travel and tourism industry by being very sensitive to local culture, its preservation, uh, of course, the protection and preservation of the environment, and basically finding a sustainable livelihood, you know, uh, through all of these uh, pillars, right? Um, it is, I, I would like to connect this being very closely linked to homestays, okay? Um, and, and homestays in which how we can spread out footfall, like I mentioned, every destination in, in the country will be having a similar issue of having a lot of people visit one particular area at a time, you know? So we, this is the concept that we are trying to look at uh, in the Northeast and in Sikkim, definitely, of how we can decongest our very heavily congested areas. Okay, uh, Julie, next slide, please. So homestays, um, uh, the definition very pretty, uh, pr pretty simple. I mean, uh, a few extra rooms that you have in your home and you let out uh, to host uh, guests, visitors. Uh, Sikkim at least has about 1300 registered homestays. And, uh, you know, they are the key uh, they, they are the key to ecotourism experiences in Sikkim, okay? Uh, your hosts are, are experienced hosts, hospitable, you know, uh, they, are, they can be your travel companions, your guides, uh, you know, folk tales, sharing local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and even uh, uh, culinary secrets, right? Um, let me just quickly get on through this screen. On your left-hand side, the, the picture that, that I'm holding a Tibetan carpet there. Uh, so that is a, a homestay in North Sikkim in Lachin. Uh, the Tibetan carpet is, is interestingly, uh, you know, in, in these parts, very, very few people are doing it now. The, the gentleman next to me there, it, it is his mom who actually did, uh, you know, uh, the weave for this carpet. And there are very, very few ladies uh, who are into this anymore. And the carpets are very expensive. And the Tibetan weave carpets are known to be among the strongest in the world, you know, surpassing even the, the Persian carpets for that matter, right? Um, so an experience like this in a homestay, for example. Uh, on your right at the top, that's a 150 year old uh, uh, old uh, lecture home. And that's a homestay in the capital city of Gangtok. Uh, very simple, very beautiful and uh, located 10 minutes walking distance from the heart of the city. Right. Uh, and on your bottom, that's, that's again uh, an eco lodge uh, in uh, Western Sikkim. And I think uh, what is important here is that, uh, you know, homestays in, in, in Sikkim in these parts, they cater to almost everybody. Like you can have an 800 rupee per day with all meals included to an 8,000 rupee per day, which means, you know, a, a fussy traveler or a very adventurous traveler, you know, it, there's something for everybody. Okay. And it's a, it's a great way to travel. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I think it's intrinsically linked uh, to sustainable travel because you find yourself in pristine locations, uh, which would otherwise have been missed if you went to the typical spots. Right. Um, Julie, can we have the next slide, please? So I'm trying to look at a, a, a way of describing more of an ecotourism experience through some of these pictures here, right? Uh, the big picture on the left, that's uh, Chopta Valley. Okay, so Chopta is in North Sikkim. Uh, and 90% uh, of people who travel here are actually going to uh, Gurudongmar Lake. Okay, so that's 18,000 feet altitude, one of the highest, uh, you know, lakes that you can reach in a vehicle, you know, and 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 very very popular tourist uh, tourist destination. But people miss out that when you're actually going to Gurudongmar, if you actually step out of your vehicle and walk two minutes down the road, you can have this entire huge valley with oxbow lakes all to yourself, with uh, you know uh, numerous numerous more than 12, 13 varieties of wild rhododendron and uh, uh, alpine plant and animal species here. The famous cobra lily, for example, too, right? Um, similarly, uh, on your right-hand side, uh, that's actually a, a trek uh, to the Lashar Valley. Now, most people coming to Sikkim would have heard, if they've done some research, they talk about treks to the Kanjinjanga Base Camp, which is very popular. But this in particular is very interesting because uh, the Lashar Valley is, 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 is really highly underrated. Uh, not very difficult to get to. It's located around 14,000 feet in altitude. And the trek is, it's not just an experience of going on a trek, but it actually lands you at this place called Zachu. Okay. Very beautiful location. And it's the summer pasture land, you know, uh, sorry, the winter pasture land of the nomadic herdsmen there known as the Dokpas. So they are the keepers of the yak. Okay. So at this point of time, uh, this particular trek uh, head out at a period called uh, Drukatshichi. And in, in very simple terms, it's basically when uh, the, the Dokpas have this really fun activity of what we call a yak race. Now, if anybody has been around yaks enough, you'll know that 
uh, they're not meant to be written. Okay, so they have a mind of their own and they're really, really, um, you know, yeah, you cannot really write a yak. So it's really funny once you get up there. So you have these guys riding on a yak and it's more for bragging rights. And it's just an excuse to have a good time. And so what's interesting is that, you know, a trek like this takes you to an experience like that. And the Dokpas are a dying community because nobody, you know, the life, the lifestyle is too harsh. And they are a very, very crucial component of the ecosystem in these parts. So when we have travelers visiting and experiencing these things uh, with these people here, they realize the importance of, you know, maintaining and upkeeping their culture and their traditions. So that's a beautiful experience up there. And of course, uh, a picture of a typical rhododendron, that's I think a rhododendron arboreum. Um, a lot of these flowers, over 40 varieties of wild rhododendron you can see in a mix of these uh, photos across uh, this slide, right? Uh, Julie, can we have the next slide, please? I think uh, with that, I'd like to wrap up uh, with a video uh, and uh, thank you. And I hope it's a very, very short time that I had to talk about Sikkim here, but do, do come visit the Northeast soon. Thank you. That brings us end to the presentation. Um, sorry for the inconvenience. I think three minutes we lost because my internet uh, connection was poor. Ironic, we thought it would be David's in uh, Nagaland whose connection would go, but it happened to be mine sitting in Bangalore. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much for making the time to attend it. And hopefully it'll influence your travel to the Northeast. Uh, yeah. A special thanks to the Ministry of Tourism. We really appreciate uh, being given this platform. Ms. Bra, Ms. Mehta, Ms. Sharma, uh, Mr. Rangarajan, Mr. Rao, and your team. It's such a positive mes message, especially during the days of lockdown, to create this platform for travel in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear presenters. I think it's been a phenomenal uh, webinar today. And I'm sure a lot of us are already packing our bags, listening to 14 degrees. Uh, I was freezing. Delhi is at 47. A lot of questions have come in. Some I've tried to answer along, but some I would like to ask uh, some of you. That uh, people have asked that the transport access to Itanagar from, uh, and also to Tawang. Could one of <coughs> Yeah, I'll take that. So the transport access to Tawang, you have to go by road. Uh, you set off from Gohati, the two ways. Uh, from Tezpur is a bad road. I don't suggest you take that right now. You go from Orang side and it will take you around nine hours to get to Sangti and then an additional five hours to get to Tawang. Now, Itanagar, though it's the capital and it's in Arunachal Pradesh, it is, it's a big state, right? So you have to come back to Assam and then go back to the Tawang side. So actually, it'll take you 12 hours to go to, from Itanagar all the way back. You come down to Tezpur and then you go back all the way to Sangti. So because it is a mountainous region, you cannot just cut across the state. You have to come all the way back and go back up.
I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. Uh, the other question is about uh, that how many days are sufficient to visit Nagaland? Would one of you like to answer that? Um, I would. Uh, well, ma'am, uh, in Nagaland, um, see, uh, there are a lot of districts, there are 11 districts, and if you uh, want to visit the lesser, uh, lesser traveled areas of Nagaland, then maybe two weeks is a good time to do it. But if you're just coming in into Kohima and uh, the surrounding areas, then I think uh, a six day, seven day tour is a, is a good time to do it. Uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, people wanted to know about Hornbill, that when does Hornbill festival happen? And is there enough accommodation to go by? Uh, the Hornbill festival starts on the 1st of uh, December and goes up to the 10th of December every year. And, um, well, there is accommodation. Uh, uh, from two years back, we have actively very aggressively promoted boom stays and uh, tenting accommodation. So uh, there is uh, more or less enough for people coming in. Of course, you have to compromise a little bit on the quality of accommodation, but I think um, uh, there is enough uh, beds to go around for people. Yeah. Also, another question on our, our uh, tour again is Santi between Dimang and Tawang. And can one go from Dibrugar or one does one need to go from Guwahati? No, so again, from Dibrugar, it's a different entrance to Arunachal Pradesh. You have to come around uh, from Guwahati, it's much closer, yes. So from Dibrugar, you have to go through Tezpur again. And Santi is not between uh, Dirang and Tawang. Santi is 12 kilometers off Dirang. So you have to take a detour and you'll be there in 12 kilometers. There would take you around half an hour. So, yeah, it's not really in between, but it's right beside Dira. Okay. Now, uh, somebody had a very interesting question on this whole thing that we are talking about, the vocal for local and encouraging uh, local arts, craft forms to, uh, to be not only maintained, but actually to become uh, mainstays of livelihood. That can the paper, which is made by the Mompas, can it be turned into plates and glasses? And would that not be so good to be recycled then? See, I, it's, I've, the paper is a very thin paper. We've actually been exploring what else we can do with it, apart from uh, just the scriptures that it's used for. I'm not too sure about plates and glasses because it is a very thin, thin paper. Maybe if you put a lot of it together, but then it's handmade paper, so it again gets a little expensive that way. But uh, definitely you can use it in things like lampshades. That's something that we've been working on, lampshades and little booklets, uh, maybe to, to sketch on and things like that, because it is a very thin paper. You're, it's not uh, completely opaque in the sense, some, when you write on it, the other side kind of, you can see it. Hello? Can you hear me? Ma'am, you're on mute. Yeah, you are. Ma'am is on mute. Huh? I'm so glad that I am also struggling today with technology. Traveling and not be on technology for so long now. Yeah, you were so worried about David, and you know because of this cyclone and everything in Sikkim, but it seems to be Delhi and Bangalore that has the problem. Yes, we hope. Yes, we and fun of course has wreaked so much uh, havoc in uh, West Bengal and particularly in Calcutta and the southern part of Bengal. We hope that uh, there is going to be recovery out of that soon. I believe yesterday also there was a lot of rain and thunderstorm. So we hope that uh, nature is going to be kind. Already we, the world is struggling in fact with the COVID impact and Corona. And we hope that very soon we should all be uh, you know, safer and COVID will be behind us. We can not only travel, but also resume our normal life activities. But in the meantime, uh, the, the best way we can showcase to you our incredible country is by bringing you on screen with the presenters from all over the country and 
showcasing the beautiful elements of our country. So therefore, uh, I'm going to say a thank you to Julie, Pinso, Devraj, David at this juncture for bringing such amazing elements. I've got a very good feedback uh, for today's webinar. The presentations, the pictures, the trails, everything was very nice. And viewers, uh, in case you have logged on and have seen but want to revisit this webinar or want to refer it to your friends and family, it comes as a repository on the Ministry of Tourism's website later on a YouTube version. So you can keep revisiting these uh, webinars at your leisure. And also when you want to travel and again want to have a look at those fine points, you can surely do that. And uh, we do also hope uh, that you're going to keep joining us as the lockdown opens. We had run a poll a couple of weeks back asking that as lockdowns open, it wouldn't be possible for us to do three uh, in a week. So we'll be restricting to one a week or maybe two a week from next week. But on this Saturday, as we move from the green and the water laden areas of the eastern part of India, we're going to go diametrically opposite to the very, very desert and a marshy kind of a land. These are the salt marsh in the Thar Desert, in the Kutch region of Gujarat. So very different from where we are today. So enjoy the cold of Northeast today at 14 degrees. And we're gonna take you to blistering Thar Desert comes on Saturday, that is 30th of May, 11 a.m. We are going to be once again logging back to the Dekhopna Desh webinar series. Thank you so much, NEGD, and thank you so much, viewers. Keep yourself safe. Keep yourself healthy. Continue to maintain the social distancing. Keep washing your hands and take good care of your health. And keep enjoying with us the Dekhopna Desh. Namaskar. And see you once again on Saturday, the 30th of May, in the heat, the sweltering heat of the Thar Desert, 11 a.m. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.